The students from Remember the Titans movie with Denzel Washington, T.C. Holmes? T.C. Williams. T.C. Williams. Williams. Won't you welcome young people, all seniors here, government students. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And, and Madam T uh, Instructor, would you introduce yourself, please? T.C. Williams, thanks for coming. It's always it's about the children. I'm sure we'll be joined by a few, and I'll be in and out, and I want to make sure that we keep it going. J just let me just say a little bit about what's going on in Capitol Hill since the government kids are, the students are here with us. As you know, over the, well, now almost seven days ago, um, the bottom fell out of Wall Street. On Friday, our Congress leaders started meeting with the President and the Treasury. On Monday, the President and Treasury presented a three-bill, three-page bill that asked for $700 billion. Don't ask him any questions. Don't want any oversight. Just give us the money. Of course, in the wisdom of the House and Senate, U.S. House, U.S. Senate, we said no way and have begun working over the last 72 hours for something that might look presentable want you to know that 70% of both the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House are currently opposed to the, to, the, to the legislation. The congressman on our side is Congressman Barney Frank from Massachusetts, an expert genius man and chairs our Financial Services Committee, is working on another bill. Senator Dodd, you may have heard that name, Chris Dodd on the Senate side is working on another bill that has oversight in it. Irene Swafferman, who, who moves quickly. That's Irene. Let's give her a hand. She's done a marvelous job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, a member of our Congressional Black Caucus staff. And I bring you greetings from our Congressional Black Caucus and welcome to the 38th Annual Legislative Conference. Um, I've been in Congress for 12 years and probably been coming to this since I was a state legislator 25 years or more. It's a great place to meet people, to learn, to interact, to build your own portfolio, and we hope that you will do that. This whole issue of going green, and the Congress just passed an a energy bill last, last couple of weeks now, uh, working with the Senate to try to get something out, may not get it. This Congress, we call it sine dies in the state, but ends its session. The 110th session of Congress ends on December 31st. Uh, I first want to let all of you know and ask you, pleading with you, please get out to vote. Get your families out to vote, whoever you're supporting. America needs strong leadership, and I'm a Democrat, so obviously I want you to vote for Senator Barack Obama, but I'm not here to, to do that today. I want you to check the candidates, check their records, turn off the TVs, get your families together, talk about it back and forth, and then pick who you think will be better. One of the two will be head of our country and the leader of the free world. So with that aside, let's go back to going green. I have with us and five outstanding experts, and this is going to be an interchange. They're not talking at you, we're talking with you. And as we move on and go through this, and I'll be getting the wink to get back to the Capitol, I was going to introduce them, but I think I'm going to change the format just a bit so we can keep it lively. We're going to start from the far end, and we're going to have you introduce yourself for two minutes. Don't give your big five-minute speech. But in the room, we have students and professionals and other people who are interested in green. We have industry people here. And one of the things that I, housing people here, that I, I always look at is when we look at uh, the green and the environment is our universities. What curricula is available? Uh, we have some of our energy companies here at the table and you'll hear more about them. But why don't we start at the end, end and give everyone a minute and a half or two to introduce yourself, please. Okay. I'm Warren Washington. I'm a, center, a, a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, I, I'm one of those people that uh, invented climate models. I'm a mathematician, physicist type. At the time, I was uh, a young high school student, as some of you are out there. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do with, with my life, but I prepared myself in math and chemistry and physics, and, and I went on to uh, build a model which... Uh, uh, actually uh, was the largest c contributor to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that we, we shared on the Nobel Prize with Al Gore, 
that was in, in 2007. Mm -hmm. Shared that prize, Pulitzer Prize, with Mr. Gore. Yes. Very fine. And and I just wanted to, just to say that I've, I've had an opportunity to do all kinds of things, and I think there's an opportunity for you in science. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Please, Madam. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nia Robinson. Um, extremely excited to be here, especially because I am a Detroit native. All right. Um, <laughs> I am, thank you, I'm the director of the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Initiative, and I'm really excited to see young people here in this session because right now what we're seeing around the country is that, you know, there's a lot of activism and a lot of excitement around climate, and that, that activism and excitement is coming a lot from young people um, from everywhere from elementary school to college campuses. Um, there's a lot of work happening also just in grassroots communities around the country where people are really getting activated and fighting fossil fuel and petrochemical facilities that are located in their backyards. Um, so I'm, like I said earlier, I'm extremely excited to be here and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Doctor, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Bullard. I direct the Environmental Justice Resource Center at Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, our resource center uh, basically um, uh, does research, uh, policy analysis, um, education, training, outreach to communities that are dealing with all kinds of environmental health uh, issues. Uh, I have an endowed chair in the Department of Sociology that was uh, founded by <coughs> W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, my university was founded by the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865 to educate uh, former slaves, so I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. This is my 20-something uh, CBC uh, conference, and uh, I'm excited because these are exciting times, and particularly when it comes to the issue that uh, we'll be addressing in this panel because it touches uh, every aspect of our lives. And I think if we are to be uh, successful in addressing climate change, uh, we have to have those that are most vulnerable in the room when policies are being made. So I think that's, uh, that is the most important takeaway that I'd like to uh, leave you with uh, before I get into my spiel. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert, Robert Harris, I'm perhaps the happiest person up here because I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a retired Vice President of Environmental Affairs at Pacific Gas and Electric Company in San Francisco. I spent 34 years with the company, first 17 years on the legal side as a lawyer for the company, and then the last 17 years as a business executive for the company, and I retired as Vice President of Environmental Affairs. Uh, during my tenure with the company, I held a lot of issues, including the opportunity to, and this is especially for the uh, young students, had opportunity to argue a case in the United States Supreme Court, and of course, uh, win the case. Uh, secondly, uh, the latter part of my career dealt uh, with the environment. I was the first environmental uh, officer for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. And while uh, an officer for the company, we did a lot of innovative things, one of which uh, I will probably talk about later was the closing of the Hunters Point power plant right in the middle of a black neighborhood in San Francisco. And I can perhaps go into some of the acrimony surrounding that, why we did it, and the real impact of doing that. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Trevor Lauer. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for DT Energy, and we have the uh, honor and privilege of serving the city of Detroit and the Southeast Michigan region. I'm happy to be here today and talk about renewables, green, going green. When I think about it, I think about it in terms of sustainability, and I'll just touch quickly on two things. We recently passed a large piece of legislation in Michigan to address renewables and energy efficiency which to me are the foundation of going green and the foundation of sustainability. The other piece I'll mention quickly is I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old son, and when I think about sustainability, it's very simple for me. I want the world to be a better place for my two children than it's been for me. And I think it's something we all have to focus on. And there are answers. There's no silver bullet, but there may be a silver shotgun shell. Hmm. There's a lot of things that we have to do in concert to make this all work. So I'm anxious to share some of those ideas and thoughts with you. Thank you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this year's annual legislative conference produced by Irene Swasserman and Swasserman. Say it, please. Swafferman and my staff and our sponsors. And by the way, sponsoring today's uh, with us is the Bipartisan Policy, Policy Center. 
Bipartisan Policy Center also help us bring this together. The correct title and name for this, and you've heard the introduction, A New Green, A Climate of Change for Environmental Justice. And you heard what some of the presenters will be talking about. I want you to listen. I want you to have your questions together. And as I go to vote, and, and I will be back, I'd like to present to a young man from our energy company who's been a real supporter of mine and, and very on top of this issue, who will handle this until I get back. Won't you welcome Mr. Renz Hoaxma. Thank you, Renz, for handling this. I shall return. Thank you, Congresswoman. We will keep this uh, moving here this afternoon. Um, the intent and topics to be covered here in the panel are, are to get into the subject of climate change, uh, to also have a discussion about uh, at-risk populations. So as we talk about climate change and green energy, uh, what are some of the risks as well as the opportunities? So what are the careers that might exist as we look at uh, what is evolving uh, in the energy sector and looking at climate issues? And uh, then finally, uh, get into some of the uh, legislative opportunities or policy opportunities that are out there. So um, to lead off in our discussion, we'll start back with uh, uh, Dr. Washington. Thank you. <clears throat> this will be an interesting test of me. I usually give lots of lectures and talks, but to do it in five minutes is going to be <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very difficult to explain about climate change. But I'll try. Uh, the, first of all, um, we've actually measured on the temperature change globally for 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 some time, uh, fairly accurately, uh, actually going back to about 1880 up until the present, and, and the climate has warmed up by by roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we expect that it'll probably go up to th three or four degrees more, maybe even more, uh, in the, by the end of the century. And we can identify on what is the cause of that. If you look back over the last 600,000 years, you, 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 you see the climate goes up and down uh, based upon the, the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And, uh, and on that orbit, uh, that goes in and out of an ice age every 50 to 70,000 years. Now, the, what we're doing over a, over um, a, a, a couple of century time span is equivalent to, to sort of what happens over 30 or 40 or 50,000 years. So we are rapidly changing on the climate. Uh, in this last 30 years, nine uh, of the last 10 warmest years occurred in the last decade. So we're finding uh, that we're breaking records almost every year. Ocean temperatures are increasing, and we're seeing melting glaciers. Sea ice extent, you've seen that on television, uh, is shrinking in the Arctic. And uh, uh, in this last two years, on the sea ice has, has gone to its lowest level ever in the, in, in the, the last 100,000 years. So uh, man is, is the cause of this. And the reason that we know that man is causing this is because if you do ice cores where you dig into the ice over Greenland and Antarctica, you can actually capture the air bubbles that go back to 600,000 years ago. And you can take the air out and see what the carbon dioxide content is. And you can correlate that with, with the temperature. And every time that the carbon dioxide goes up, the earth warms up, and when the carbon dioxide goes down, it, on the earth cools off. And so uh, we're putting a lot of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And it's not caused by natural <laughs> cycles. You'll hear the skeptics talking about sort of natural cycles, but it, but it isn't true. Uh, we expect that hurricanes will, will be more intense and stronger, and we, we see some evidence of that. Um, and that we expect that the rainfall events will be stronger. And in the places where you have, it's relatively dry, and the droughts will be more strong. Uh, the heat waves will also increase significantly. And it will actually generate heat waves in different places than we've had them be before. Now, that's going to impact uh, the minorities, 
African Americans and others who who struggle with the cost of air conditioning and so forth uh, be because it's going to be more expensive for them to uh, deal with. Uh, and I've been involved in, as I said earlier, my introduction with with, with building com uh, climate models, and we've improved those models significantly over the, the last 40 years. They were very crude because we had very you know, limited computers, and now um, we run these models on the world's fastest com computers, so that we're able to simulate the heat waves, the El Ninos, the, all of the, of the natural things in the climate system. But we can do experiments on, on what happens when you increase the uh, greenhouse gases. And, and, and at the time that you do that, you can see in our models that the climate warms up very significantly. So on the uh, skeptics who seem to be having lots of uh, of representation by the by some some parts of the energy in, industry are really sort of miss sort of, sort of the representing on the science on the on the vast majority of scientists who are who are knowledgeable in this area agree that climate change is very important and is happening and on the same sort of people who said to you that smoking does not harm your your health now are using the same sort of arguments against climate change. I think I'll end it right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Uh, we will have a chance and an opportunity for all of you to participate in questions later on through the program. I think by that time, Congresswoman Kilpatrick will be back to sort of moderate some of that discussion. But to get further into some of the social impacts, uh, Nina Robinson. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I just want to give a quick correction. It's actually Nia Robinson. Thank you. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. I'm actually extremely excited and hopeful that this issue is getting as much attention as it is, especially from ent entities like you know the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Um, it's, a really, it's really important because what we're seeing right now is that around the country, African American communities, Latino and Hispanic communities and other people of color communities are bearing the brunt of our fossil fuel addiction and are really the ones who are most vulnerable to what's happening right now. But it's rare that we see that kind of story in the media. You know, we see stories about polar bears, we see stories about falling glaciers, and if there is conversation about people and about land, the, the conversation about the people is usually people who are, are very far away, folks in far off countries. Um, but here in the United States, we also have a climate change story. We have a story of climate injustice. It's a story that includes poisons and pollutants that are pumped out of fossil fuel and petrochemical facilities that surround neighborhoods with, you know, crippling health insurance numbers. 71% of African Americans are living in counties that are in violation of federal air standards right now. And I'm sure all of us in here know a child or a grown-up who's suffering from asthma. It's also a story of stronger storms and hurricanes, erratic weather, extreme heat, and floods and droughts that are continuously damaging our communities that are already weakened financially with unemployment and poverty rates. It's also a story of economic hardships that are made even worse by the spike and energy cost. So what we're seeing is that from the causes to Katrina to our checkbooks, African Americans, other people of color, indigenous peoples, and low-income peoples are bearing the brunt of this issue. You know, they're really the, we're really the ones who've become more vulnerable to this crisis. And so we're, he we're hearing a lot of, this issue is getting a lot of attention. In the media, it's getting a lot of attention congressionally. And so, What's really important as we go forward and talk about how we're going to handle this issue, how we're going to tackle it as a country, it's important that we make sure that the people who are living in the communities that have been the most damaged and the most hurt by this issue have a seat at the table when we're talking about how we're going to fix it. There's no way that we can come up with good, solid climate policy without having that inclusion. 
it's going to have to be policy that addresses the issues of race and class that takes the issue of climate change out of that box of environment and really talks about it as an issue, is, as the issue that it is. It's a human rights issue and it's a civil rights issue. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Nia, thank you very much. To talk about uh, some of the opportunities uh, that exist uh, as you look at climate change and some of and how that will be addressed, uh, Dr. Bullard. Thank you. Uh, for the last 30 years, I've uh, worked with communities uh, all across this country in different parts of the world. Uh, I've testified in Congress and at various hearings and served as an expert witness on lawsuits, uh, civil rights, human rights uh, lawsuits. And, and I've written uh, 15 books that deal with housing, transportation, environment, health, land use, uh, air quality, etc. Uh, but it's, uh, even though it's 14, 15 books or so, uh, it's just one book. Uh, but don't tell anybody. Uh, it, it all comes to the issue of fairness, equity, and justice. Uh, global climate change looms as uh, the environmental uh, justice and human rights issue of the 21st century. And I think that if we are to address these issues, we have to look at opportunities that are available to us not only to talk about climate change and some of the um, uh, mitigation uh, uh, strategies but also, and also the, some of the adaptation strategies, we also have to talk about how uh, there can be uh, multiplier effects uh, if we are to address um, trying to get a, a smaller uh, carbon footprint. Uh, I, I just take, for example, the issue of transportation and energy and air quality and health. All those four of those things are interrelated. Uh, we're talking about 60% of our energy use goes into transportation. Transportation-related air pollution um, is a big cause of many of the problems uh, that Nia talked about in terms of rise in asthma rates, respiratory illnesses, et cetera. Uh, if you look at ground level, ground level ozone and NOx, PM10, these are major uh, pollutants that are contributed by uh, the cars we drive, the buses we ride, and the trucks that run, zip up and down our neighborhood. So if we are to address this, there are opportunities to uh, deal with climate change, but also there's a deal, there's a, by reducing the amount of fossil fuels we use uh, by having alternative uh, energy sources, but also to get, to clean up our air, to make healthier cities, to grow our cities smarter, and to come up with um, equitable development. And so when we talk about this whole question of having more compact uh, communities that are more walkable, that, have, that are greener, uh, and I say greener in the context of having access to parks, you know, there is a parks justice movement uh, access, and we know having access to parks can make us, and green space can make us healthier. Uh, it can address, when we start addressing green and, uh, and access to green space, we can address the health issue of obesity, childhood obesity. And so the land use and having uh, more um, public transit and alternatives to driving uh, means that we can increase uh, livability and mobility. Because the way our cities are laid out, metropolitan regions are laid out right now, jobs have, many jobs have left the suburbs, and, uh, have left the cities and gone into deep suburbs. We have what's called job sprawl, office sprawl. And African Americans, for example, have a spatial mismatch between where the jobs are and where we live. And so if we're talking about growing smarter, growing more equitable, uh, by using uh, this whole issue of climate justice, uh, by reining in uh, this transportation sprawl and our over-dependence on automobiles and fossil fuels, these are issues that I think uh, we, can, we, can, we can address. I think the upcoming uh, reauthorization of safety lieu, the highway bill, uh, opportunities to build into that more equitable, more transportation equity, transportation justice, um, uh, climate issues that, that climate justice into that's new, uh, the new uh, reauthorization. It's also important that we talk about the issue of emergency response and the extent to which FEMA and, and the Homeland Security uh, actually is dealing with disaster transportation and the extent to which transit is, figures largely into that. If we look at 
this whole question of access to health care and healthy communities and, and this whole question of geography of pollution, um, all communities are not created equal. There are some that are more equal than others. And if we talk about where uh, a lot of the problems, hot spots are, uh, you don't have to have a PhD to see how it's, it maps. Inequity maps closely with race and class. If you look at this whole question of, of how do we, uh, what kinds of strategies do we uh, need to come up with to uh, address this, there are, there are a number of major elements in, in a plan that we are calling for. You know, the pollute, there needs to be a, a pollute to pay uh, principle imp implemented. Uh, we need to make sure that we have energy assistance for communities, uh, families that, that are, are hurting. Uh, if you talk about uh, extreme heat waves and, and extreme weather events, and we talk about the rising cost of, of gasoline and, and energy, uh, we know that there needs to be some subsidies and offsets. Climate justice uh, coalitions are calling for all kinds of steps to uh, stem this the inequities that already exist. We're not talking about something into the future. We're talking about right now. So we're talking about energy efficiency, uh, use uh, this diffusion of technology uh, to ensure that uh, we do have our houses and our businesses that are that are energy efficient, as well as using the state-of-the-art technology in terms of green building uh, technology. Uh, and finally, I think it's important that that we bring into uh, this whole discussion uh, more and more stakeholders and that involves making sure that our universities, our historically black colleges and universities uh, and our uh, uh, people of color organizations uh, are in the room at the table and, and have a voice and as Malcolm said just because you sit at the table doesn't make you a diner and I think the climate justice movement is about creating diners uh, at, at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bullard. Uh, Mr. Harris, in, in re, not in response, but building off this discussion, can you give us a little bit of background on how you see the industry's role, your experience having uh, been one of the leaders at PG&E? Happy to do that, and I'm happy to do that as a former or retired vice president of PG&E because I can say whatever I want to say. <laughs> Nobody can fire me. Uh, look at the fact that 13% of America's population is African American. African Americans emit per capita 20% less greenhouse gases than uh, the majority population. Yet, go to any African American community, you will see the facilities of industries located where? There. So. The question becomes, why should they uh, share a disproportionate part of the impact? Uh, my position is that, of course, uh, they should not. It's important in my view, and that's one of the things I fought hard for uh, while I was an officer at uh, the uh, pg and &E, is that corporations ought to exhibit responsibility in the areas in which they operate. Therefore, every corporation in America that operates, major corporation, in my view, should have an environmental justice policy. Without such a policy, it is unlikely that you are going to treat those areas in a fair manner. So one of the things that I uh, worked for and sought after was to get the company to adopt one, and it did. And if you can go on to the PGE.com website and see the PG&E environmental justice um, uh, policy, it still is, if I remember, the only major corporation in the nation that has such a policy. Well, climate change is a real issue, as uh, Dr. Washington indicated and as others have indicated. In resolving that issue, we all have a responsibility. And from the corporate side, our responsibility as corporations is to make certain that we are dealing with the communities in which we operate in a fair manner. Uh, let me give just one example 
of what I consider to be dealing with the community in a fair ma manner <clears throat> that has climate implications as well as environmental justice implications, then I'll quiet down. Uh, for the last 70 years in Hunters Point in San Francisco, there was a pg and &E power plant called the Hunters Point Power Plant, which operated. Many complaints from the residents there about uh, the emissions coming from the power plant. And of course, on the part of pg and &E, many denials. That's not happening. Well, you can argue it, it's either having an impact or it isn't. But at the end of the day, there is a problem. So in the late 1990s, we decided to change our behavior, and that is engage the community. And we made an agreement to close down that plant. Uh, in closing that plant, we worked with the uh, agencies, we worked with community groups, environmental justice groups there in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And ultimately, uh, two, two years ago, two and a half years ago, we were able to close that plant. The plant uh, is being demolished, decommissioned. Uh, it was finally lev leveled on uh, uh, last week. 28-acre site. Now, the future use of that site will be determined by the city and county of San Francisco with, I hope, some input from the people who uh, live in Harness Point. But uh, Ms. Robinson will probably uh, correctly point out that it is unlikely that in the final analysis they're going to have much say so as to what happens to that particular site. But if you employ uh, environmental justice principles, it's no question that they should have a significant input in terms of what that future site is going to be used for, whether it's used for uh, more commercial uh, operations or for uh, green, uh, green jobs, etc. But it is that type of uh, interaction that uh, industry must have with the community that I think is very, very critical to both climate change and environmental justice. Thank you. Uh, now just to wrap up with the uh, initial comments here. Uh, Mr. Lauer, if you can give us some perspective on how the utility sector and the industry is evolving and changing in response to climate and some of the interest in green energy. Thank you. <clears throat> Unlike Robert, I'm not retired. <laughs> um, I'd like to be. Um, you know, I want to address a kind of what the industry is doing because I think the uh, energy industry is moving at a lightning pace right now to address sustainability. The changes we've seen in our industry in the last five years have literally been unthinkable before. And I've brought a couple slides with me that I want to go through to try to just explain some of the changes. When you think about delivery of electricity and power in our industry, we worked off a highly centralized model. Um, utilities in this country built big things. We built big power plants, we built big transmission lines, and we operated them. That was the model of business that we've moved towards. But with the sustainability movement, and, and I I would argue that we've reached a tipping point. It's not a question of whether or not we're going to address these issues. It's a matter of at the pace we address those and the, the economic skill that we address these because there's, there's different sides when you look at the economics of how we can address these. But we've moved from this highly centralized model to one that addresses renewables, energy efficiency, sustainability, net metering, solar power. So if you look at the slide, it, it just gives you a sense of how the typical electrical system will work. I'll put up what I believe is the utility of the future in the way it works. If you start looking at the slides today, we're dealing with things as an industry that we hadn't dealt with before. Instead of building large central, central plant coal plants, we're widely distributing solar power on roofs and commercial office buildings. The technology being applied to solar and to wind power today is moving at such a pace. Last year it was the second highest investment in the country in clean tech going after solving some of these issues. We have to be able to have this distributed generation sources work back into our systems. Uh, energy storage is the holy grail of our, our industry. One of the issues with the electrical industry is that you can't store electricity. There's a lot of companies working at a very feverish pace to try to figure out how we actually store electricity in a large scale. Central, central station power. Uh, my country, or my company, as of last week, filed to build a new nuclear power plant. 
Some people in here may find that unpopular, but it emits no carbon. Um, one of the things that we have to do is recognize renewables and nuclear power will go hand in hand to solve the issues that we have going forward. Energy efficiency was mentioned by a couple people up here. The single best kilowatt hour you have is the one that you don't use. And in this country, we've lost sight of energy efficiency. There's some very basic things that we can be doing to reduce our carbon footprint. DTE Energy, along with a handful of other companies, hired McKinsey Consulting to do a study. And McKinsey completed their study last year. And the single cheapest way to abate carbon to stop global warming is to do energy efficiency. It's simple things. We insulate our houses differently. We use compact fluorescent light bulbs. We use LED light technology. We use high efficiency appliances. There's some very commonsensical basic things we can be doing as a country right now to help address the issues that we have. Um, a lot of technology is starting to apply to our business. And as we apply that technology, as we invest in R&D and technology in the alternative energy space, we have the ability as a country to solve this issue. It's not a question of whether or not we can solve it. It's a question that can we legislate the right policies and can we push those policies forward fast enough to solve this issue in a timely manner? I'll stop with that. Trevor, thank you. Before we go to some of the more general questions, let me just give the panel a chance as to whether anybody on the panel wants to sort of uh, elaborate or respond to anything they've already heard from some of the other panelists. Yes. All right. <laughs> Dr. Bullock, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think it's important that we understand that in many cases, uh, industries, and particularly polluting industries, do not always do the right thing uh, voluntarily. And oftentimes, it takes lawsuits. You know, I moved from California in 1994 to to Atlanta, and my years in California, in LA, I worked with the the folks up in Bayview Hunters Point and worked. Um, trying to get that uh, PG&E uh, facility closed down. And over the years, you could see the demographic transition occurring in that particular community. Now, uh, I wrote a book called Residential Apartheid, The American Legacy. If you look at the demographic transition in San Francisco, the only, the last remaining black community in San Francisco was Bayview Hunters Point, and, that, not, and that's changing. It's almost gone. And it's almost gone. So if you make the connection, between the closure of the plant, the cleanup of the shipyard, and the and the the transportation bark going down Third Street, that area is changing. It will no longer be black. It's going to be gentrified. It is gentrified at rapid pace. And we know when things gentrify from black to white, white people will not stand for having a power plant polluting their Starbucks. Okay. So when we talk about <laughs> technology transfer, technology transfer does not always occur in the same communities at the same time. There is a technology lag. If you look at dirty power plants, more than 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant, many of which were grandfathered in, uh, compared with 56% of, of whites. And so these old dinosaurs that are still pumping out pollution, mercury, you, it, it just spilling over into our communities, these are still operating now, even years when conversions for, to, uh, uh, to natural gas was supposedly cleaner. But somehow the residuals get left in our communities. We get, we get stuck with the dirty stuff. And I have a, a word I won't use, but it has kids in the room. But we get stuck with the dirty stuff. And so if you talk about making sure that we eliminate this technology transfer lag and say that all communities are created equal and we should all have access to this clean technology at the same time. The, the, the other part is I think it's important for us to understand that this is not rocket science. This is not rocket science. And so when we talk about moving uh, a lot of these um, uh, moving away from a lot of this dirty stuff and allowing and providing resources to communities to, to, to do the weatherization, to have houses and our schools, you know, our school buses, you know, our, our garbage uh, uh, trucks and et cetera. 
going to more cleaner uh, and, and talking about how electricity and all this stuff, this is doable because it's been done in Europe for many years. So the, the problem is not whether or not we have, you know, the, the wherewithal and, and the knowledge. I think it's a matter, it's, a lot of it is political, more so than economic. Um, I also think that it's important when we're, when we're talking about how we're going to get out of this dirty energy economy that we ensure that the monies that are going into renewable energies go into renewable energies and we, we stay away from, from nuclear. Because yes, while nuclear does not emit CO2, it is it's extremely dirty, especially in the mining of uranium and then the disposal of the waste. So while we're, you know, when we're talking about nuclear, we have to be extremely honest about what that actually looks like. And while it, might, while it may not look dirty from the plant in our communities, you should talk to some of our Native American brothers and sisters who are living on reservations where they're mining that uranium. Let me, let me add on that note, tomorrow morning at 10.30 uh, a.m., there will be a panel uh, sponsored by uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn on the nuclear al alternative. So I would encourage you to come and uh, listen to the dialogue. Uh, there is a new dialogue concerning that. Uh, I, I don't know where I particularly come down on the issue, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's a dialogue that's worth uh, engaging in. I, I know uh, Congressman Clyburn has some interesting thoughts on it, as well as other people. So be sure and come at 1030 tomorrow morning. And if I could add one thing, I do know where I come at it. Um, <laughs> I'll give you some statistics, and I think they're statistics we have to think about. Today, the average customer pays about eight cents for electricity for the generation portion. If we use a combination of what's referred to as nuclear power and renewables in the future, in the next 15 years, we hope to be able to limit those increases to somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 cents. So think about that. Your energy costs are going to double in the next 15 years, whether you're in Michigan, whether you're in Washington, D.C., Alaska, Florida, they will double, no matter what we do. If we eliminate the opportunities for nuclear and some of the other base load options we have and rely simply on solar and what I'll call the wind regime, which we're actively in, that's estimated to be somewhere between 35 and 45 cents 15 years from now. I would just submit to you that as an economy, I'm not sure we can suffer or go through the economic shock that that'll put our economy through. We've built an infrastructure that's 50 years old that has to be replaced. Uh, and I won't argue with any of the points that the, the panelists are making. I think they're all very valid points, but I think we have to think about the economics of what we do uh, as we move forward. Let me, let me just let me add a footnote to that uh, <clears throat> coming from the utility industry. Uh, the cost of a nuclear power plant is, is great, primarily because of uh, the, the licensing and operating process. There have been procedures adopted uh, in the last four or five years that we hope will lessen that cost. But historically, uh, that cost, upfront cost, was tremendous. Uh, PG&E, for example, in 1969, uh, decided to build a nuclear power plant called the, called the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant, estimated at somewhere close to $900 million. It went online in 1986 at a cost of $6.8 billion. But in its operation over the years, uh, it has proven to be very efficient. And of course, the cost of a kilowatt coming from that now is substantially less. So it, it's a fertile opportunity here to talk about uh, a very real problem. And Clyburn, Congressman Clyburn tomorrow is going to have a very, very interesting panel on that. I'm going to be a member of that panel as well. So <laughs> please come and listen to it. We're going to hit each other hard tomorrow. Well, it does raise a question. Uh, we're talking about a transition here from the traditional setup that we sort of saw in Trevor's initial slide, where you're relying on base load generation, whether that's coal, nuclear, or natural gas has become a, become a significant player. Renewables nationally is a very, very small percentage. Um, anybody willing to take on the question of how much do you think communities are willing to absorb in the way of cost to make this transition? Uh. 
let me let me put it this way. Uh, without moving to that transition, there are communities that are bearing uh, a burden right now disproportionately. Uh, and those communities are communities of least wealth and communities that have the least access to insurance and health care. So whatever regimen or structure we move toward, it definitely has to be uh, fair, just, and equitable. Um, and, and I think if, if we just come up with a formula, uh, assuming everything is equal, we will build on inequity. Uh, I, th I think it's important that, uh, that we, again, emphasize, um, since this is a, a CBC conference, that, that African Americans produce 20% less of greenhouse gases. And so, but again, when everything is being treated, it's, it's assumed that everybody is, is, is equal in terms of, of, of the pain. So I, I do think that, that we need to be very careful when we uh, talk about these, um, um, what we're going to do with nuclear and, and all this other stuff. Uh, I'll leave that for the panel tomorrow. Dr. Washington? Uh, one of the things that is not in the equation for economics that, that has been talked about so far is what happens when sea level rises and what happens when uh, climate change causes more damage? Just uh, uh, this, this Ike hurricane that came through just a few weeks ago, when we're talking about several billion dollars. And so when you, when, you, when you look at the economics of it, you shouldn't just look at, at how much it costs. It, there's a certain cost in not doing certain things. And that cost can be enormous and can impact people. Uh, for, for, the, for those of you that are in the Boston area, you, you will find that Harvard and MIT will be under sea level probably by the middle of the next century. Now, there are very wealthy areas in Boston. Big boats, but they can't They'll either have to move or they will build dikes around that. So, that, so they can afford to do that probably because they have lots of, of, uh, of uh, funding. But there will be a lot of people who live close to sea level who can't and will have to, have to uh, uh, migrate. There are people in uh, certain countries like Peru and Bolivia whose all the, their uh, only water source is melting glaciers. And they will not have fresh water at the end of this century. So you can imagine the tensions that will be, uh, and this will be true in, 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 in certain parts of India and China, where the glaciers and Himalayas are, are essentially disappearing. And you can just imagine what's going to be the, the the tendencies when large migrations of people want to go from one country to another. So this is a national security issue, and that gets factored into the economics too. So climate change has its costs, but those aren't taken into account in the in most economic analysis. Yep, very sobering factors. Just for those of you who are um, uh, have come in, uh, Congresswoman Kilpatrick will be back. Uh, she had to go and vote. They've had some votes, so she will be back. She asked that I stand in in her absence for a minute, um, just so that you know that she will be here uh, to continue to host this forum. Um, there were a couple of questions. I saw a hand go up, but we will come to questions. There are a couple of questions the panelists were asked to prepare to address, and I want to move to those here, uh, just to get some of that on the table, and then we will go to the audience for questions. Um, but looking at this transition, then, we're talking about a transition from where we are today to a future where we have cleaner energy, uh, less reliability on some of the uh, sources of power that we've come to depend on, what are the opportunities? What are the economic opportunities that that creates for these young people in the room that may be looking at the future? Um, what should they be looking at as they, as they look at uh, both where they focus their education and uh, the kinds of technologies or other things that they might be focused on? 
Anybody want to start with that, I, Mr. Harris? I think uh, really it's important now to start focusing on the new economy, the so-called green economy. If you look out into the future by the year 2030, it is uh, projected that the green economy will contribute something around $4.53 trillion, which means that there's going to be lots of opportunity. If you look back two years to 2006, uh, green jobs in the United States, we had roughly 8 million people uh, in green jobs contributing something like $933 billion, not million, billion dollars to the economy. So as you pursue your education, be sure and think in terms of what the future is likely to look like. So I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity in the area of, uh, so, uh, of the uh, green economy. Trevor, did you? Yeah, I would just add, I think in the energy industry, if you look at the typical energy company, we're a graying industry. Um, I laugh at our company. It's hard to find somebody that's had less than 30 years of employment time there. When you look at the energy industry, two things are going to happen. One, we're going to hire a tremendous amount of new workers into our workforce uh, across all spectrums of the energy platform. Um, secondly, we're going to apply technology to our industry like we've never applied technology before. Uh, the way the computerization of our industry is coming in, again, it's just frighteningly fast how technology is being applied. And I think it creates such great opportunities uh, around uh, opportunities for young people. I can tell you with my own two children, I'm, I'm focusing them heavily. We went and visited a wind farm uh, over the summer. Um, it's a way to stimulate their thinking at an early age to start to think about careers that they may want to be into. And these are the types of jobs that are going to drive the energy industry. Um, and we're going to be hiring a tremendous amount of workers over the next 15 to 20 years. Dr. Bullard? Yeah, I think, I think moving beyond green jobs and talking about green careers and looking at the need for um, um, for individuals in these emerging fields and expanded fields, uh, there will we will always need lawyers. <laughs> right on. Lawyers run the world, uh, whether it's green, red, black, or brown. I think in terms of as we green our economy, we will need uh, to have those disciplines and those programs uh, that that focus on this these new. Uh, emerging areas and expanded areas, whether it's architecture, uh, uh, urban design, planning, uh, housing, uh, environmental policy, environmental sciences, um, uh, hydrology. I mean, we start looking at all these, uh, uh, these areas and seeing how, uh, if you go to these fields in most universities, um, you don't see any black people in the room, in the class. And so I, these are areas that, uh, right now, uh, not just talking about futuristic. Right now, uh, these uh, these fields are, have have great uh, opportunity, and I think uh, I think that when you when you prepare yourself uh, to 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 do this kind of of career, you and and if if it's uh, deep enough, I think uh, you can you can make a mark. Uh, you just won't be a worker, but you can. Uh, we talk about owners, you know, black uh, business entrepreneurs, you know, moving into these areas and uh, and for profit. And in, in in other areas, we need our nonprofits, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations, also uh, moving into these areas to to ensure that um, that we are on uh, on top of it. I think it's important that while, while we're talking about, you know, really beefing up or greening up the curriculums at our universities and working to, you know, create green jobs in our, in our communities, it's also important to stress that the revenue that we're going to need for those, for those jobs, for these new economic opportunities, has to come from, you know, polluters having to pay for emitting and causing this problem. First and foremost, I also think that when we're talking about education, we have to also talk about the education of our communities and making sure that we are having town hall meetings and roundtable meetings in our communities, stressing 
the importance of this issue, talking to our, you know, our communities and our people about how this issue is impacting them and how it's going to continue to impact them if they are not involved. And having real conversations, because you know, when people are talking about fixing this climate change issue, I'm hearing nuclear and clean coal a lot as two very strong alternatives to what we're, to, you know, what we're using for our utilities now. I saw a commercial a couple years ago that GE put out that had some coal miners that looked like supermodels. And I, you know, I've met coal miners. I've been in West Virginia. I've never <laughs> seen coal miners that look like that. So we have to, we have to take the power away from you know, the utility companies and educating our people and make sure that we're talking to them about what the real impacts are and how this is going to, you know, just cause a huge amount of environmental devastation and talk about what real alternatives are and talk about how we can, you know, we can fund these alternatives, we can put subsidies into these alternatives and make them, and make them economically affordable and viable for our communities. Dr. Washington, did you want to make a comment or I'll transition to a question on education? Uh, no, I think you can. I don't have a comment. <clears throat> okay. Um, just with regard to uh, Nia's last comment, uh, one of the things that Congresswoman Kilpatrick may be voting on right now is a package of tax credits to help incent renewable energy development and support both wind, solar, and other uh, renewable technologies. So that's up before the Congress right now. Um, there was a comment, I think, uh, Dr. Bullard, it's actually something that you mentioned about education and establishing these programs to get uh, young people much more involved uh, in looking at the new technologies and what's evolving. I'm aware that uh, MIT, I think, is one school that sort of has sponsored a competitive program around emerging technologies to get students involved in competing. I believe the California universities are involved in something similar. Uh, about a week or two ago, the University of Michigan uh, engaged in some kind of initiative like that. Uh, but going to the question of education, what are the opportunities, or put differently, what do we need to be doing to sort of make this transition effectively? Let me <clears throat> do two things very quickly. First, a footnote to Ms. Robinson concerning education. There was a recent study in California by the uh, California Research and Policy uh, Institute uh, which indicated that in the African-American community and in the Hispanic community, awareness of uh, climate issues, et cetera, was very, very low. So therefore, what she says is so important in terms of educating our own community about what's happening. Uh, secondly, of course, it is important that uh, the whole educational process be changed to do again, two things, uh, to educate uh, our future workforce uh, as well as um, uh, get grants and other opportunities for small businesses and others to go into this new uh, economy. Uh, I'm not certain in view of what's going on now on the Hill whether there's going to be any money left for uh, these kinds of projects. But we as uh, impacted people ought to be uh, having our voices heard that, hey, wait a minute, save some money for us to do the grants, et cetera. Remember, when you, when you look at what's happening in the economic uh, uh, arena now, how many investment banks, when there's one or two left, is going, how many are going to invest any money in green type projects, et cetera. So if they are not going to invest at this particular moment, and if we are willing, see that's one of the good things about being an ex uh, uh, officer in a corporation, you say anything, if they are not willing to do it, then who is going to be willing? If we're willing to give money to, to the investment bankers to get them out of their mess, then why isn't Congress willing to invest money in the green economy that's going to have a direct impact upon our lives, so it's that type of educational dialogue that we have to become more and more involved in. Of course, that's political, and that's good. Dr. Bob? As, a, as a professor with tenure, uh, I can also <laughs> say anything that I want. <laughs> I think it's important, I think it's important that, that we understand 
that a lot of it has to do with pipelines and resources. In order for us to get these, these um, green engineers and green architects and green urban planners and green whatever uh, professionals, we got to get them out of high school. If you look at the high school uh, dropout rate among African Americans and other uh, students of color, it's, it is embarrassing and it is criminal. If we look at the amount of funds that have been put into um, science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, it's, uh, it's not enough. You know, we're spending so much money on a war in Iraq and we're getting ready to spend $700 billion to bail out bankers, but yet and still we won't educate our young people. If we talk about, you know, dealing with climate change and looking at a year uh, where we're talking about reductions uh, with, with, with targets uh, 2050, this country will, no, will look nothing like it looks today. 2050, people of color will be in the majority. And so if we don't look at, at the fact that what we're talking about planning for right now, people are planning for something that for people who, well, it, <laughs> So right. I think we have to be on guard and we have to really uh, uh, be uh, aggressive about how our educational institutions are not designed, in many cases, to educate. And so if we talk about how we, how we somehow warehouse college, our uh, high school students, and then by the time we're talking about looking at the freshman year in California, the, uh, at University of California, for example, there was a study done, I think there was only just a handful of black kids in San Francisco that qualified for, for UC. And I'm like, sure. so, so we talk about some statistics that are just staggering. And so when we talk about addressing uh, the future of who are going to be leading these, in, these new industries and leading these new businesses and leading these new um, um, uh, corporations or higher, whatever the configurations are, we have to really talk about how we're going to make sure that, that we stem this dropout, we educate uh, for the future, and, and we talk about doing a, an aggressive job in, in making sure that we fund uh, those things we see as important, not as amenities, but fund them as, as something that's, uh, that's necessary. That's necessary. And in some schools, high schools, you can graduate from high school without taking math that's an, or, or science. That's cold. That's, that's, that's cold-blooded. So, so I, I think we're not saying we have to produce all scientists and all mathematicians, but you do need, you know, to have some working knowledge of, uh, of, this, of these fields. And, and I, I think environment is the same way, to understand what the environment. For any black person to say I'm not an environmentalist, always ask, well, do you breathe the water? I mean, do you breathe the air? And they said most people will say yes. Do you drink water? Most people will say yes. Uh, do you eat food? And they say yes. And I say, well, if you answer two out of three, you're an environmentalist. You just may not know it. So how it's framed oftentimes can impact how we can recruit uh, people into the areas that we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about uh, regreening our curriculum. <laughs> and I see a few, and I've helped to mentor and, 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 and train, uh, you know, several. But I, I see, in the same way that, that Bob sees it too, is, is, is we just don't have very many students who are capable of, of getting into these subject areas. And we need them. There's no question that we need them. And I just think there's an, a great opportunity if, if, if people are qualified and want to work hard a little bit. Yeah. But, but if you work hard for a few years, and then you have all kinds of generous rewards in terms of salary and, be, and hopefully a stable job. <laughs> and and uh, you can help out on your own community and the world uh, community, uh, you know, doing some, some uh, good. So if any of you students are around, uh, please contact us. There, you know, one of the best ways that I find sort of young students is they, they either Google me or they find me somewhere else, and I help them. I, I help them, you know, get into college and into graduate school and to start a career. That's, I, I, I was helped by uh, the, uh, people who were ahead of me, and I feel a, a major responsibility to help others uh, to sort of get into the field. That's our so, job. It's a wonderful invitation. I'll go to the last question before we open uh, up to the audience uh, for the group. 
but uh, it really goes to, as we leave here today, what can we do? What steps can we begin to take as we walk out here today that either make a difference in our own life specifically related to energy, energy use, and green energy, and then make a difference to the broader community? Mia, do you want to lead off? Yeah, I'll start. And I'll, I'll just say, too, because I know there's going to be a lot that come from the panel. Um, one is, you know, to really push people to, to educate themselves on the issue and to get involved on a state level in things that are happening. Um, whether that be things that are happening with grassroots and community organizations or things that are happening um, in terms of legislation. The second one is that we also have a really great opportunity to be more responsible consumers right now. Um, I think a lot of times, especially like in terms of fashion, a few years ago you couldn't get anything cute that was considered green. You know, it was like kind of weird looking, frumpy, uh, hemp clothing, but now everywhere from Levi's to Nordstrom's to Macy's and Saks Fifth Avenue are carrying absolutely amazing designers, um, even some of the designers that we know very well, like, you know, Ralph Lauren, and Klein, all of those folks are like really being extremely excited about the whole movement around eco-chic fashion. So I'm just using fashion as an example. I really urge people to just be a lot more mindful about the things that you buy, about how you buy, and how you purchase, and where you put your money. Trevor, do you want to yeah, I, I will go back to what I said earlier, and I think it's all about energy efficiency. I think there's just some very practical things that people can do in their own homes and in their own lives. Um, energy efficient light bulbs, high efficient appliances, high efficiency HVAC systems, they're the things we use every day. And um, the technology has been developed. There's the technology from a system being put in today to one 10 years ago will cut your energy usage by 50%. All of that contributes greatly to what we're talking about. And it is the simple, most commonsensical things. But as a country, we also have to put legislative policies in place that help encourage that movement towards energy efficiency. <clears throat> I find it interesting some of the comments that panelists made, and uh, I cannot disagree with that. Uh, we are not spending the money in the right places right now. There's a lot of things that we're doing. For instance, we just passed a bill in Michigan that will allow the utilities to spend somewhere in the range, my two utilities, to spend somewhere in the range of $150 million a year to incent customers to buy more energy efficient appliances, light bulbs, weatherization, commonsensical things that help people every day. Why aren't we doing that as a country? Why aren't we doing that in every state? Why aren't we pressing as hard as we can on those issues? Uh, but we're not. It's very hard to get that type of momentum. I can't tell you how hard it was in Michigan to get that legislation passed so that people would understand it. So I think it's very commonsensical things. And I have to go back to the last question very quickly, and it's on education because I have two young children. Look, it's all about K through six, right? Kindergarten through sixth grade. It's when children learn to learn. It's when they learn to love to learn. Um, one of my criticisms of today's education system is we're focusing on higher education. When children get to high school and they get to higher education, if they haven't decided to learn, it won't help them. We have to focus on childhood education in this country. The fact that we're not focusing on it is just criminal. Now, when I graduated from college, when I got my undergraduate degree, I went to where I was offered a job, right? It's probably what almost everybody in here did. Today, when people graduate from college, they don't go to where the jobs offered, they go to where they want to live. And as we talk about developing this new society and we talk about developing these new jobs, that technology will be developed where the educated people are. They will be developed where people want to live in the country. We have to address K through 6 so that there's not a, not a, a collection of people here and a collection of people there, but a collection of people everywhere across the country where all these jobs will come in and affect all of us. Um, it's all about education. It's all about K through six, in my opinion. Okay. Any other comments on that before we open up to the audience? Oh, I, I just had one uh, point, again, uh, stressing the issue of transportation. And since 80% uh, of African Americans live in uh, metropolitan regions, and 56% of us live in, in central cities, and 25% of us don't, on cars. So when we talk about, you know, addressing um, 
some of these issues in equity and climate and energy, um, uh, uh, transportation and energy costs uh, are, are big issues. So, so alternatives to driving, uh, I think what you can do is to uh, look at what's look at where the money is being spent in terms of tax dollars and the extent to which, you know, it's emphasis is on roads versus transit and as opposed to how the land use planning. So your metropolitan organization, that's the organization that covers the region that, that dispenses all of the monies for the region uh, based, you know, over 25, 30 years. And so I think if you can get involved, can make meetings and can have input, that can greatly impact what happens within your region and also in terms of your state. Um, in terms of how, uh, if you follow the money, you can tell who's important and who's not. And oftentimes we don't follow the dollars. We end up, you know, fussing about something that's happening to us as opposed to us getting involved in, in trying to impact how tax dollars are being spent. This is your money. And so if your money is being used to subsidize um, uh, suburban sprawl and, and it's hurting uh, central city neighborhoods and, and disinvestment, you need to get involved. And so. I think those are areas where, where uh, you, it, it calls for organizing and mobilizing and have, have an, an urgency about it because uh, oftentimes people are making decisions and spending your money without uh, you having any knowledge uh, other than reading it in the paper how money is being spent.